Hey, what is going on everyone? The one and only here and I hope everyone had an amazing time spending it with family over the holiday season. This is it. A brand new decade. The roaring 20s except only this time without the stock market crash. Hopefully. But anyway, with a new decade brings new goals and this is my very first video of 2020 and the very first of the decade. I know I only recently started making videos in late 2018, but still, I am beyond excited to see what my channel can do in the next couple of years. Today I have a very exciting video for you all. I love to shake things up on this channel. Sometimes we do unboxings, sometimes we do drop tests, other times we do in-depth reviews, but today we have yet another showdown. This is for the MacBook Pro 16 inch world title. Here we have the base model MacBook Pro 16 inch that starts out at $2400 and our other contender is a fully spec model, all but the storage that comes in at $4300. The question today is, does an extra $1900 equate in performance gains worthy of that insanely steep price tag? Does the 8 core i9 really outperform the 6 core i7 by big margins? What about graphics? How does the 5300M with 4GB of GDDR6 memory compare against the mighty 5500M with 8 gigs of GDDR6 memory? Well stay tuned because we have a variety of stress tests to see whether it is worth your time and money to upgrade some key specs to your portable investment. Let's dive straight into these tests. Okay, so first things first, specs. Now for my regular consumers who just want a MacBook for iMessage and to browse Facebook and make the occasional Word document, I'll go ahead and tell you, the MacBook Pro is not the machine for you. If you fall into this category, the MacBook Air is probably going to be more up your alley. The MacBook Pro really is the best way to carry around a lot of power without having to be confined to the limitations of a desktop computer. Obviously with those, it's tough carrying around your Mac Pro around with you and that display. And with the new redesign of the MacBook Pro now with the larger chassis, the MacBook Pro 16 inch packs an immense amount of power in a still relatively small footprint. Let's go over specs. If you divert your attention to this expertly made chart that took me 7 minutes to complete, you will see a lot of words. If you examine it a little closer, you will also notice there are a lot of numbers. My everyday non-techies will probably fast forward this part or have left the video completely, but for everyone well versed with tech terminology, you will probably know that you can configure your MacBook Pro at the time of purchase. You have your options for your processor with a 6 core or octa core design. You can increase your RAM and would advise to do so at purchase since Apple is very weird about upgrading the RAM yourself. It is near impossible to do it yourself on the MacBook Pro since the RAM is soldered on. I guess it is technically possible if you know what you're doing, but I would normally advise against it, plus it voids your warranty. You can also increase your graphics performance and storage. So yeah, here we have the base model, and on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have a fully spec model with the best 8-core processor, a 5500M graphics card with 8GB of GDDR6 memory, 64GB of insanely fast 2666MHz DDR4 memory, and I opted for a 2TB SSD because I have my 4TB MacBook Pro now and I didn't feel the need to pay an additional $600 for 4TB on my MacBook Pro. 2TB should be plenty enough. So anyway, let's begin. For the first test, you already know what it is, the good old nice Geekbench 5 test to test the single core and multi-core performances of both machines. What is interesting though, is for the first 2 or 3 tests, I decided to test both MacBooks outdoors and indoors to see if a change in temperature would have any effect on raw scores. I hypothesized that it would probably be a negligible effect, but still wanted to see what happened. When I recorded these tests, down here in the south, we had temperatures of about 39 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 4 degrees Celsius. So first, let's start with the indoor test here at my workstation. For the base model, we see a single core Geekbench score of 1068 compared to a single core score of 1173 on the octa core fully spec model. 
On the multi-core side, we see scores of 5,688 and 7,388 for the fully spec model, a huge leap in performance. This is likely due to the fully spec model having those two additional cores, which really helps out on multi-threaded applications. But when I did the same test outdoors having the chassis be nice and cool, we get scores of 1,089 for single core on the base model and 1,210 for the fully spec model. Surprisingly, they are higher, but not by huge margins. And on the multi-core side, we have 5,731 for the base and 7,456 for the fully spec. Again, if we compare, we see slightly higher figures, but this all goes back to heat dissipation as those processors prefer to work under cooler conditions. Okay, staying with Geekbench 5, we test them out to see their open CL scores and again, we test indoors and outdoors. For OpenCL at my workstation, the base model scored 23,190, while the fully spec came in at a higher 27,448. But if we compare it to the outdoor test, surprise, surprise, once again we have higher scores. Are you noticing a pattern here? A score of 23,266 for outdoors on the base and a score of 27,491 on the fully spec. And last one for Geekbench, we move on to the metal scores, which really gauges at the performance of the graphics on each device. Indoors, we see scores of 24,003 and 28,615 for the base and fully spec respectively. For the outdoors, the metal test yielded better results on the base, but not the fully spec with scores of 24,238 versus 28,089 for the base and fully spec respectively. We carry on the same indoor versus outdoor testing for the Cinebench R20 test. The Cinebench test is notorious for having those processors to max out. It's like that super annoying roid head coach you had in high school that wanted you to max out daily. Like, chill bro, I ain't trying to die today. So anyway, at my workstation for the Cinebench test, not only did the fan sound like a rocket was taking off, but afterwards, both computers were so hot, I would be surprised if I didn't get first degree burns if I had these notebooks on my lap. Slight exaggeration? Maybe. Stupid hot MacBook? Yes sir. The base model scored 2,806, while the fully spec came in with a much higher 3,459, a 23% increase in performance. On the outdoor end, we get scores of 2,772 and 3,427. I guess with this test making the fans kick into overdrive, the external temperature doesn't really have much of an effect. For those people that say you can't game on a Mac, you'd be wrong my friend. Partially wrong that is. It is now entirely possible to game on MacBooks. I know maybe 4 or 5 years back, it was like comparing a Game Boy Color to an Xbox One X when comparing gaming experiences on a Mac versus PCs. But Apple has come a long way in improving their graphics performance on their Mac lineup. The Heaven Graphics Benchmark Test is known as the Gaming Test amongst us tech nerds and is pretty accurate at measuring the capabilities of your machine. The Heaven Benchmark takes into account internal temperature while also averaging out your frame rate and giving you a Heaven score. Both machines fared pretty well, with the base model achieving a score of 1704, while the fully spec achieved a score of 1851 at my workstation, with the machines having pretty respectable frame rates. The base averaged out at about 67.6 frames per second, while the fully spec came in at 73.5. Doing some quick math, this means we see an 8% increase in performance according to this benchmarking test. When we took the machines outside, we see results so similar that they are within the margin of error. The base had a score of 1698 with an average frame per second of 67.4, while the fully spec had a score of 1867 and averaged 74.1 frames per second. Not too shabby for a Mac notebook. Up next, I wanted to decipher whether the 500GB SSD on the base model was any different from the higher storage options. Typically, you would expect to see faster SSD performance on higher capacities, but when I tested them out using Blackmagic's disk read and write test, my results were pretty similar and saw no drastic change between the 500GB SSD versus the 2TB variant. The 2TB variant was slightly higher as you can see here. The base SSD option averaged around 2.6 gigs a second on write, while the 2TB hovered and averaged around 2.7 gigs on write. 
On the read speed side though, the 500 gigabyte SSD performs slightly better somehow, staying consistently at about 2.7 gigs a second, while the 2 terabyte was at about 2.5 gigs a second. Both are pretty fast SSDs and these results show that whether you get a 500 gig SSD or a 2 terabyte SSD, you should expect to achieve similar read and write speeds. This means applications and things such as stored Final Cut Pro projects or other downloaded content will be extremely snappy and open up in a flash. We now go over to some other tests that aren't as common. First up, we have our GFX metal test, which is pretty long and stressful test for the computers. It takes several minutes to complete, but gives a more in-depth picture at how well the processors and mainly the graphics cards are performing. Out of a multitude of tests, on our 1440p Aztec Ruin test, we see our base model scored a respectable 86.8 frames per second, while the fully spec 5500M with 8GB of memory came in at 90.8 frames per second, showcasing about a 5% increase increase in performance. Within the same GFX test, we also see our offloaded 1440p Manhattan test and see 182.6 frames per second on the base and 189.7 on the fully spec, equating in roughly in about a 4% increase in performance. Jumping up from the base graphics card to the 5500M with 8 gigs is only $200, much better than what Apple previously offered on the 15 inch. To upgrade to the higher end cards, you had to jump up to the 26 700 base model and then upgrade to the Vega graphics cards because it wasn't offered on the base $2400 model back then so it's nice to see Apple giving us more options. Testing out a combination of the processor load and mainly the graphics card, we move over to our blender test which is again a notoriously long and stressful test. There are two options when benchmarking with blender, you can either do the full test or a quick version of the test. I opted for the quicker version as the long one would likely spend more than an hour to complete and because we're doing a variety of tests, not just the blender test, I deemed it enough to get a good picture of where these two graphics cards stand. After the test, our winner was the fully model with a time of 19 minutes and 50 seconds to complete. The base model didn't do too bad, especially having half of the GDDR6 memory that the 5500M option comes with, closing in at 24 minutes and 28 seconds. This means the fully spec model was roughly about 20% faster than the base. So ask yourself, is the $200 upgrade for graphics worth it? I would say yes. For many content creators, time is money and this is just one example. Imagine working with longer projects with plenty of animations or even 3D renders. The addition of those 4 extra gigs makes a huge difference on your workload. And now, for my video editors, let's do some real world tests to see how well both perform on Final Cut Pro. There's this cool 5K test called Bruce X that is basically this really short video to test how fast the video can export. I used the same compressor settings on both machines and exported the Bruce X test video. The fully spec MacBook Pro handled it like a champ exporting it in just 31 seconds with the base not too far behind exporting it in roughly 50 seconds. But I think this was too short to really make any decisive conclusions. So then I recorded a 5 minute 4K clip on my Sony a7 III and exported it with my compressor settings. This 5 minute clip had no edits, just a plain and simple export. The fully spec behemoth handled it in 5 minutes and 11 seconds, while the base did it in 5 minutes and 56 seconds. I now did a few edits, made a few transitions, animations, and added some 3D text to the video as well as add a song to the video. After doing so and replicating the same test, both fared well and came in at slightly longer times, which is to be expected when adding edits to a video. The fully spec model exported it in 5 minutes and 49 seconds, while the base not too far behind at 6 minutes and 14 seconds, with my Final Cut Pro settings having background rendering turned off on both machines. This does show improvements over the base model, but small improvements that really make you wonder whether upgrading is worth it. My recommendation, if you make videos as a hobby or for a living, upgrade. You won't regret it, but if you do the occasional picture slideshow on Final Cut and have no real deadlines to speak of, then I'd say save your $200 and stick with the baseline model. And finally, my photographers, I didn't forget about you all. 
I do photography as well on the side and use Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom pretty regularly. Scrubbing, brushing, and zooming in and out is as fluid as can be and I don't notice any differences between both models. Using Photoshop tools is quick and snappy on both so rest assured whatever model you get these pro apps shouldn't cause you a problem. As a last experiment for this video, I exported the same 100 pictures of my cousin's dog and my crazy little nephew and niece's baptism and saw minimal differences. The export for the 124.2 megapixel JPEG files took just 3 minutes and 42 seconds on the fully spec and 3 minutes and 57 seconds for the base model. I don't really use much of Logic Pro for instruments or music creation as I don't have much practice with digital audio workstations, abbreviated as DAWs, as in like, what's up my dog, but I'm sure the more cores the MacBook has, in theory, the better performance you should get. Let me know what Mac you have and how it performs. So what have we learned today? I learned something, and that's that the near $2,000 difference in price between these two models does make a difference, but nothing major. Like this isn't like going from an iPhone 4 to an iPhone 11 Pro, no sir, there are differences and definitely some modest performance gains, but you truly have to weigh out your options and weigh out that credit line to see if those differences are worth it for you. My job as a YouTuber is to showcase to you guys my honest opinions about tech and to showcase the capabilities behind these expensive machines. You guys saw the tests, you guys saw the numbers, it is now up to you to decide what kind of MacBook facilitates your unique needs and use cases. Of course, you don't have to choose solely between the base model and fully spec models, you can max out RAM while keeping everything at the base level. Or maybe you don't do extreme multitasking, but have loads of pictures, projects, and documents and need to increase just your SSD. The choice is yours, and if I at least helped out one person in making a better more informed decision, then I did my job right and I will be happy. I'm super glad that Apple did increase the base storage from a measly 256 gigs now up to half a terabyte. Improvements of course. If you found this video useful guys, you know what to do. Smash that like button and comment down below your thoughts on these tests. Were you surprised at the results? Dropping down comments helps the algorithm and YouTube really likes that. So that makes the algorithm push out my content and push it out to more people. So hopefully this can reach as many eyes and ears as possible to help out as many people with their MacBook Pro purchase. That's been it for me guys. It's been a pleasure working hard for you guys and the grind continues. It's a new year and time for new opportunities. Until next time guys, take care of yourselves and each other. Peace.